Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Heather Masso. I'm a HUD certified housing counselor with Panquis. And today with us are four panelists from First National Bank. And today we're going to be talking about Homebuyer One on One, our second uh, lunch and learn. I've been approved. Now what? So I'd like to have the panelists introduce themselves and let us know what areas they work in to start off. And if we could start with Miss Becky, please, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Heather. I'm excited to be here today. My name is Becky St. Clair. I am a mortgage loan officer at the Rockport branch of First National Bank. I serve customers in Knox, Waldo, and Kennebec counties. Wonderful. David, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Netto, and I'm a mortgage loan officer in the Dammer Scotter branch, and I serve Lincoln and Oxford counties. Awesome. Miss Brenda. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Brenda Fernald. I'm a mortgage loan officer out of the Bar Harbor and Southwest Harbor branches and serve our customers here on Mount Desert Island and in other villages um, throughout Hancock County. And last but not least, Ms. Lorna, please. Ms. Lorna, you're muted. Thank you for that. Perfect. Well, I'm saying welcome, everybody. <laughs> I'm Lorna Weber, and I am the mortgage loan officer in our Booth Bay Harbor office, and I service clients from Lincoln County and York County. Wonderful. So as we're going, we'd like you to please ask questions in our chat box. We have several questions that each panelist will be answering today. If you missed our first lunch and learn the four C's of credit in the beginning process of getting prepared to purchase a home, you can go on Panquist's Facebook page to rewatch that, or you can log on to our uh, panquist.org website as well to watch that. But let's dive in and again, please ask questions in the chat and as soon as they come in, we'll make sure we address those. So we're gonna start with Miss Becky, if we could please. And we wanted to ask the difference. So what is the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification? Sure, so the difference between the two, a pre-qualification is a more informal um, approval and that's gonna be based off information that the borrower is providing. Um, they might say, this is my credit score, this is my income, these are my liabilities, and they're going to get an approval amount based on that information. The pre-approval is going to take it a step further and is going to require a formal application. Your credit will actually be run, um, income will be verified, so a lot more verification with the pre-approval. And with that, uh, your lender is going to be able to give you a maximum pre-approval loan amount so you know ahead of time going into the buying process of what your pre-approved figure is. And um, a pre-approval letter is suggested as one of the first steps in the home buying process. Wonderful, thank you. Moving over to David, what are the different type of mortgages I may be reviewed for? That's a great question, Heather. Uh, so it's dependent on your situation. If you're a first time home buyer, you may be reviewed for anything that's low down payment to potentially no down payment, uh, such as main state housing or rural development. Potentially, if you're a veteran, could be looking at a VA loan, um, but backing up and looking at main state housing. If you're a first time home buyer and you take the first time or participate in the first time home buyer program, then upon completion, you would qualify for an advantage credit of $5,000 that can be applied towards your down payment and closing costs. Also, if you're not a first time home buyer and you're looking at more conventional financing, then you could potentially be looking at uh, Freddie Mac financing or secondary market financing. Typically, the, the difference there is it might be for more established borrowers and also that can provide you a, uh, usually provide you a lower interest rate than, than other loans might, but that would be dependent on 
um, credit and the the type of the type of property that you're purchasing and loan to value as well. Um, if that wasn't an option for you, there's also portfolio or in-house financing that we can look into um, that can offer more flexible underwriting guidelines for us, but can typically come with a with a higher interest rate as well. Um, and if you're looking to establish a new home, we can also look into construction financing, or if you're looking to um, start from the ground up, we might also look into land purchase financing as well. Wonderful, that's a lot of good options. Miss Brenda, what would be included in my mortgage payment? So I, I guess I would start by saying that the borrower would absolutely know what the payment will be prior to closing. Um, the final um, monthly amount would be disclosed in a, in a closing disclosure, and then again would be in the promissory note as part of the uh, closing loan documents. That payment would include a principal portion, which is um, a portion of the amount borrowed. Um, it would also include an interest portion, which is the cost of borrowing that money for, for that one particular month. Additionally, the payment would include one twelfth of the annual property taxes due, as well as one twelfth of the um, homeowner's insurance premium that would be due annually. Thank you so much. Lorna, I've heard I may have to pay mortgage insurance if I take out a mortgage. Could you explain that as well? Yes, uh, mortgage insurance is also known um, as PMI, and that's private mortgage insurance. And that can become part of your, your monthly payment, as Brenda was just describing, in um, a form of an additional insurance premium. The, the private mortgage insurance will enable a borrower who doesn't or might not have 20% uh, down. Generally, it's required if you have less than 20% down. And that is an insurance policy that protects the bank against loss should they have to foreclose on a property if a customer was unable to maintain their payments. Um, it's not generally, it's based usually upon the loan to value. So the percentage of the purchase price that you're borrowing and your credit score. So with more money down or an improved credit score, you might have a lower monthly premium. And that can definitely be a factor in how much you can be pre-approved for as well. With some programs that PMI will last for the life of the loan. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if, for instance, if something is main housing uses USDA rural development, and that's a percentage of the outstanding loan amount in the form of a monthly addition to your payment throughout the life of the loan. For uh, traditional mortgage products and conventional mortgage products, there's, there's private mortgage insurance companies that can also enable somebody to come to a loan with less than 20% down. And that can be canceled at certain times throughout the process. Whatever the terms are for your mortgage insurance are gonna be laid out clearly in all of your clone, lo loan closing documents. So you'll know what to expect. You can sometimes cancel early if you've made extra payments on your principal and you've reached that 80%, 20% threshold earlier than expected. If you just on to make your monthly payment, once you meet 78% of your original value, it will automatically drop off. Wonderful, that's good information. Becky, I understand I have to put money down when I'm purchasing a home. Can you explain how much I can expect to have to put down possibly? Sure, Heather. So the down payment is going to be a percentage of the purchase price that the borrower is expected to pay on their own. It's not included in the loan amount. So um, it's going to depend on the loan program that you're moving forward with. Some of those um, first time home buyers loans might have a 0% uh, down payment option. Other conventional loan products are going to have um, down payment options from 3% all the way to 20% down. And like Lorna said, anything with less than 20% down, you're gonna be looking at that additional monthly premium for private mortgage insurance. 
I think uh, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that there are many low down payment options available. So just um, discuss your scenario with your lender and come up with the best plan. Wonderful, thank you. David, I understand that there are costs um, associated with purchasing home. Um, what should I expect to pay for closing costs? That's a fantastic question, Heather. So closing costs are, are fees that are associated with your, with your loan process. Um, they will vary and will depend on the type of product that you're applying for. Uh, for example, some loan types might have fees that are specific to that to that loan type and don't apply to others. Um, but in general, you know, you'll see a bank processing fee, you'll see an appraisal fee, you'll see a title search fee among among others, and that will all be laid out for you um, throughout the entire throughout the process uh, by your lender. And in general, it's very difficult to kind of give a, a specific number as to what you can expect to pay for closing costs, because again, it, it will vary from loan type to loan type. Um, but in general, on the average transaction, you may be looking at anywhere between maybe five to $7,000 in closing costs on the average transaction. Um, but again, you know, on a case by case basis, feel free to reach out to your, to your lender and discuss what an estimated cost might be based on a specific type of loan transaction. And that's good information and goes back to our first one-on-one -on -one in preparing financially with credit and all with the closing costs and down payments we need to pay. So thank you, David. Brenda, um, who are the professionals that I, I could expect to be working with while um, going through a mortgage application process? There, there are definitely a number of uh, professionals that you would be interacting with. Presuming that you are pre-approved, um, you would have already met with a lender, one that you um, have an established relationship with, or perhaps somebody who had been recommended to help you through the mortgage um, process. Um, after you have uh, obtained that letter of pre-approval, you would take that to a realtor. And again, it would be somebody that you would want to have confidence in and somebody who um, knows exactly what you're looking for and will help you find the property um, to um, meet your needs. And that realtor could be somebody who's, again, recommended by somebody that you know, but also um, your lender would ha have some recommendations about realtors locally that would help you as well. Um, after that, after you have secured a, um, hopefully, purchase and sale agreement based on an offer that has been accepted, you would likely want to um, engage somebody to do an inspection on the property. Although inspections are not required by the bank, they're definitely recommended because they can be a useful tool to the borrower to know what potential um, issues may crop up with the new purchase property. Once you feel confident that the property will meet the needs, um, you would then would want to meet with an insurance agency. And it could be uh, somebody that you already work with, maybe for uh, vehicle insurance, but it could also be, uh, it's also recommended if you, if you would like to um, just get some pricing from different agencies and also get a sense for that particular agent and whether or not um, you feel that they would be somebody that you could work with comfortably. And then finally, um, at closing, you would have an attorney. Um, the attorney would also be engaged prior to closing to do title work, um, but then would be the person who would handle the, the actual closing. Thank you so much. Ms. Lorna, I hear there are different types of realtors. Um, can you break down different type of realtors that I could possibly work with during the process? Yes, thank you. Um, there are there are the sellers. There's a seller's agent who is it is usually the listing agent and has worked with the home seller to set their price and take care of things. And they they will represent the seller and advise them. There's a buyer's agent who would make an agreement with you as the the home buyer to represent you and your specific interests and. Um, broaden that search of what kind of properties you're looking for and really do that 
deep down find the right properties for you to spend your valuable time looking at. Um, then there's also uh, a situation called a dual disclosed agent. And that does, we do see that in some instances is where on the purchase contract, the same agent is listed to represent both sides of the transaction, the seller and the buyer. And that's something that you wanna educate yourself on uh, before you make that type of arrangement. There's also a transaction broker, which I can't say that I've really seen much of um, or really any, uh, but that is a broker who, who simply assists in the purchase transaction. They don't really, they don't act in any advisory capacity to the seller or the buyer. And I believe that their responsibilities um, are a bit limited, but you'd want to research that too. Um, I see most folks will get their own buyer's agents just so that they know that somebody's got their back and they're, they've got their best interest in mind when negotiating Again, like everybody is referencing uh, the, the purchase price and what if something comes shows up in an inspection, what do you do then? So the buyer broker is really important to have um, on your side. Yes, you should definitely find a broker that works best for you and sign a buyer's agreement um, to help you uh, find the right house. The transaction broker, as Lorna stated, cannot advise you on anything as you're not under an agreement with them. So very limited access for you. So moving on to Miss Becky, I found my home and I need to make an offer. Um, how, how do I make an offer to, to, to possibly purchase that home? Sure, Heather. So once you've found the home that you are interested in purchasing and you're ready to make that offer, you're going to want to work with your broker to come to the terms of the purchase and sales agreement. So you're going to want to determine what your uh, purchase price is on the offer. And that could be um, at asking price, it could be below asking price, or it could even be above asking price. And you're gonna to want to rely on your broker's expertise of the current market conditions, the location. Um, again, going to you know, hopefully have chose a broker who has your best interest in mind to help you with the, determining uh, the best price point so that your offer may be accepted. Once you've come to those terms, um, including the purchase price and, and many other things that we'll touch on um, after, but that contract is going to be presented to the seller's agent. And that's usually submitted with a deadline for a response. So once, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the seller's agent receives it, you'll typically know within a couple of days whether your offer was accepted, rejected, or if the seller has come back with a counter offer. So what that would mean is they've looked at your terms, adjusted them slightly more to their liking, and they are countering um, with their offer to see if you will agree to that. Um, at that point, you're just waiting to hear back. Wonderful. David, what are some terms that we may see that will be part of a purchase and sale agreement? Wonderful question, Heather. So some of the terms that you may see included in a purchase and sale agreement will include the financing terms. So they'll say what the expected uh, term of the mortgage will be as well in years, as well as the potential interest rate and the amount that the customer will be looking to finance. Um, other terms that you'll also see will include things such as the sales price, the amount of earnest money expected uh, to be collected from the buyer. And earnest money is simply put a, a small percentage of the purchase price that is held as like a, a down payment from the buyer of the property. Sometimes you can see as little as $500 down. And I've seen sometimes as high as like $10,000 down. And those funds are held by the real estate agent in an escrow account until time of closing. And at the time of closing, those funds are brought to the closing and are applied to the funds that need to be collected from the customer. Um, other terms that you'll see will be um, in regards to an inspection. Typically, 
the the buyer and the seller will will discuss an inspection and if the buyer wants to have an inspection done they generally have up to 15 days from the time the agreement is signed to have that inspection done and we'll discuss you know an inspection a little bit later on in this program uh, also an appraisal that will be included in the terms is the bank will require that an appraisal be done for the purchase we'll also list the closing date and what the expected closing date is in the purchase and sale agreement, as well as whether or not there's fuel proration for the purchase of the property. So sometimes the buyer and the seller will negotiate and say the home is heated by uh, heating fuel, heating oil, and there might be like half a tank left. And at time of closing, that half a tank will still be there the seller of the property might want to recoup a dollar value for what's remaining. So the settlement agent that's preparing the closing would calculate what that dollar value is, and that would be collected from the buyer at time of closing and credited to the seller. But those are just some of the terms that you would see in a purchase and sale agreement, um, as well as many others. Thank you, David. So David mentioned an appraisal and a home inspection. Brenda, can you tell us the difference between the two of those? Absolutely. Um, as David indicated, um, an appraisal is actually required by the bank. Um, an appraisal is a measure of the value of the home. Um, and that value is determined by what's happening in the current market. And it relies on recent sales to determine that value. So basically an appraiser would visit the site, they would look at recent sales that align with the subject property and use that as a measure of the market value of the property. And they assign value to the land as well as value to what they call improvements, which is actually the structure um, that is on the land. An inspection is not required by the bank. But again, as we mentioned earlier, it's highly recommended because this, um, this tool actually is a measure of the condition of the home and can really give insight as to what potential needs or expenses um, may be required um, down the road for the property. And it can reveal sometimes um, something that's not visible to you, especially as a, as a first time home buyer. Um, and it's pretty lengthy. Uh, it does really get into um, the nitty gritty of the condition of the home. Uh, I know there are some things that wouldn't reveal themselves otherwise. I just uh, bought a home four years ago and the inspection revealed that there was a radon issue. And um, undetected radon can certainly be a problem, but it can be mitigated. And it was an opportunity for me to have that conversation with the seller of the property. Um, Sometimes they can offer a concession in price, which is decreasing the price um, to allow for you to make those necessary improvements after the closing, or sometimes the seller will offer to make the repair prior to closing um, and maintain the purchase price as is. So it's, it's a great tool for the buyer to have a clear understanding of the condition of the house. Wonderful, thank you. And Lorna, I understand there are a couple of different, there are two different um, interest rates, fixed and adjustables. Would you explain the difference between those, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. The fixed rate uh, term <clears throat> just means exactly what it says, is that your interest rate, whatever you go in initially, is your interest rate for the term of your loan, whether it's 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, or somewhere in between. An adjustable rate mortgage overview just simply means that at some point during your mortgage term, which will be laid out in your loan estimate and then in your final closing docs, at some point that interest rate will be analyzed to see if it needs to change. Um, generally, an adjustable rate mortgage will have an initial fixed rate period, and that can be anywhere from one year to I've seen up to 10 years. So that means for that first period, it would be fixed at that initial rate. And then at the end of that period, um, the bank or the lender would analyze 
recognize whatever your initial terms for your mortgage were disclosed as an index, which is your base rate, and then a margin, which is the number of percentage points above that base rate that you might be considering. So your, your index might be some form or variation on a treasury bill um, rate or bond rate of some sort with maybe 3% over that. So you might have an index that's 1% plus the 3%. The next time you get your bill, your rate would be 4%. Um, I'm oversimplifying that, but they do the analysis. And then what the bank does is um, upon that, that analysis, when they establish your rate, they do need to send you advance notice. And I believe it's at least 30 days in advance to let you know that your next payment will be changing to whatever that new payment is. Um, they do have to let you know that. And then adjustable rate mortgages, generally depending on the lender, will have a rate cap. So during that, that adjustment period, each time, if it's a one-year adjustment period, it can't go up more than a certain protect percent. So there is a protection there so that your rates can't just keep going up and up. And then it's really nice when your rate is adjusted down. So if your index goes down, your rate. So you do get a notice. Um, and then there's an overall lifetime cap generally on an adjustable rate mortgage. And that's also in your closing disclosures and your other disclosures so that you know what the worst case scenario could be at some point in your, in your loan. Thank you, very well explained. Becky, now my, my offer has been accepted. What are my steps to move forward now? Sure, Heather, so that's an exciting moment. Once your offer has been accepted, um, you're gonna want to move quickly on a few things at that point. So the first thing you wanna do is get that completed signed contract, the purchase and sales agreement to your lender. That's gonna start the clock um, as far as they're concerned. It's gonna put your application officially into process, give them that property address and the purchase price. And from there, they're gonna work on compliance items, getting disclosures to you, ordering the appraisal and the title work. Um, it's also going to start the clock on some of the things that you will be responsible for taking care of kind of quickly. So there's the earnest money deposit that we talked about that typically has um, a deadline for you to get that to your broker that will be laid out in that contract. So just make sure you are um, completing that step. And then Brenda also discussed the importance of those home inspections and you're gonna have a deadline to complete those by. So um, you definitely want to get those scheduled as soon as possible for any inspections that you plan to have completed, um, building inspection, septic inspection, things of that nature. And as we discussed already, those that could change the terms of the contract. So you really wanna make sure you're getting that done in a timely manner. Uh, the only other thing I can think of is just if you have outstanding documentation with your lender, be sure to get that to them as quickly as possible, just so that nothing delays the process and everything keeps moving quickly. Thank you so much. David, how do I know what the cost of obtaining a mortgage is going to be? And that's a great question, Heather. So as Becky just mentioned, once you provide the fully executed purchase and sale agreement to your lender, that starts the clock for us. And within three business days of receiving that, we have to provide you with a initial loan disclosure package. Within that package is a document called a loan estimate. And that loan estimate will break things down for the customer as far as the amount you're borrowing, the, your monthly payment, whether or not you're including taxes and insurance into your monthly payment, and then a breakdown of the fees. We'll show everything as far as like the bank's fees, the attorney's fees, um, and if they're collecting for escrow of taxes and insurance, how much that will, will cost. It will also include any appraisal fees. Um, so all of that will be broken down on your loan estimate. And it's intended to be a, a worst case scenario. So I overemphasize on the word estimate um, because that, that's what it is. It's meant to give you a, a very worst case scenario idea of what you would need to prepare for 
as you go through this process. And as we'll touch on later, you'll receive your um, final costs uh, in a document called the closing disclosure. And that's what will tell you exactly to the penny what the, what the loan will, will cost you at time of closing. But we'll touch on that in a little bit. Wonderful. Um, I um, urge anybody that if they haven't not urged, but if anybody has any questions while we're going through this, if you could please put them in the chat so we can make we answer all your questions and you will have time after we're finished. Um, but we wanted to remind you that please, if anything pops up that you have questions about to please put it a question in the chat. So thank you, David. Brenda, I received my loan estimate and I see that there's an interest rate and an annual percentage rate or APR. Can you explain the difference between those two, please? Sure, um, that can certainly be um, very confusing for, for first time home buyers or actually anybody who is uh, purchasing a home. I sometimes feel like um, the, the buying process and the, the lending process and borrowing can be like learning a, a foreign language and interest rate and APR sounds like the same, same um, language, but it is actually pretty significantly different. The interest rate is what you would pay each year for borrowing the money that you're borrowing um, and it's assessed monthly. The APR or annual percentage rate, as you indicated, um, Heather, is a broader measure um, of the total cost of the loan. So that percentage rate includes fees for, for the transaction and account maintenance over time. And typically that APR reveals itself as slightly higher than the interest rate. The borrower pays the interest rate. The APR is actually a measure of what the total cost is for the loan. Um, and because the APR does indicate the costs in addition to the interest rate, it's a great tool to use um, in comparing banks when you're shopping for rates and um, what that experience might be like with, with different banks. Thank you so much. Miss Lorna, are there things that I should avoid during the mortgage process or any tips or tricks you might have? Well, sure. Um, of course, it's it can be very daunting for especially a first time home buyer to go through the process, even if you've done all the research in the world, there's just so much going on. Some of the, the general rule is don't do anything that's going to jeopardize your income flow or your expenses for which you've already been qualified or pre-approved, because that's very important. You wouldn't want to get to the documentation stage and um, have gotten a new car loan. And that car loan ends up making you no longer eligible for that loan. So we just caution folks, um, don't quit your job. <laughs> unless you don't need it to qualify for this loan. Moving from one job to another, if it's for a better position or you know a good circumstance, if it's in the same role and it doesn't jeopardize what we call your income and your employment stability, it's okay to do that, but you really want to have that conversation with your lender before you take any steps with that. Um, you also don't want to be co-signing for anybody because if another credit report needs to be updated before your closing, that could show new debt that could also jeopardize your approval. Um, other than that, you don't want to spend all of your savings. Um, sometimes folks don't think about this, but they'll have a savings account and they'll think, I'm going to pay off all my credit cards so that I don't have that debt so that it looks better on a loan application. And I've actually had some folks where their savings account would have been put to better use as more of a down payment rather than, um, rather than reducing some debt. It just had a different kind of impact. So if you're thinking of making any kind of changes during a pre-approval or during your application, I strongly urge that you talk with your lender to see how that might impact moving forward. Thank you, that's some really key information. And as we're talking about first time home buyer loans and you as possibly a first time home buyer, you may also wanna think about taking a home buyer education course. Um, Maine Housing has um, HomeWorks approved home buyer education classes that are eight hours. 
that you can take um, virtually right now. Um, I don't know any that are in person. There may be some. Um, Panquist is an approved educator for that. It's a, a good quality soup to nuts education. And we bring in professionals like these four panelists to help us teach the class and make sure you're better prepared to become a homeowner because it is the largest purchase you will ever make. So awesome guys, continuing on. I wanted to move to Becky and, and have her give some thoughts on considering searching for a lender that's gonna work best for you. Sure. So like Heather just said, this is going to be a huge financial investment for you, um, quite possibly the, the biggest one um, that you'll face. So you certainly want to make sure you have a lender who understands your needs. You're going to be working closely with your lender. Um, like Lorna was saying, anything changes to your financial picture, you're going to want to discuss with your lender. So it's really important to make sure that you find a lender who offers the program that you're looking at. Um, they can, of course, guide you if, if they don't to another place, but not all lenders offer main state housing loans. Um, there's just different, different types of loan programs offered by different lenders. So you definitely want to make sure your lender has a competitive interest rate, competitive closing cost. Um, maybe see if they're strictly an online lender or if they will have time to meet with you in person. Um, depending on your comfort level, it might be really important to have somebody local that you can sit down with and that can really help you through the process. Wonderful, and that loan estimate is a good tool to help you when you're searching for a lender because looking at the, the interest rate in the APR, and like was mentioned previously, the fees can tell you whether it's worth to go with a lower rate or higher rate and what's most affordable for you. So thank you so much. David, uh, when should I lock in my interest rate? That's a great question, Heather. So it's gonna depend on the type of loan that you're applying for and definitely gonna be a discussion that you wanna have with your lender. Um, if you're a first time home buyer and you're looking at applying for any type of main state housing funding, then the lender is gonna set your rate right at the start of the loan. And we're gonna reserve funds for up to 120 days on that loan request. We also have the option in the, in the event that we need more time we do have the option to extend that reservation of funds by an additional 30 days. If you're not looking for main state housing funding in that case, then, and we're looking at uh, more like Freddie Mac or secondary market financing, then we can set your rate. Uh, if that's what you're looking to do, set your rate at the start of the loan process. We would lock in the rate initially for up to 60 days. And in the event that we weren't able to close within that 60 days, then we could extend for an, up to an additional 60 days. However, there would be an additional fee that would be incurred as part of that rate lock extension. Thank you so much. And Brenda, I know you talked about the payment and what it involves. And they say that escrows could be included in my payment. Could you explain that a little further, please? Absolutely. So the escrow portion of that would be the portion that includes the property tax and homeowners insurance premium. And typically what happens is the bank establishes what's called an escrow account or also known as an escrow bucket into which the monthly portion um, designated for property taxes and homeowners insurance would be deposited. And then when those annual bills are due, the bank would actually make those payments on the borrower's behalf. And one of the benefits to an escrow um, is that it, it relieves the borrower of having to make those major annual payments, which sometimes can be problematic for borrowers. Um, additionally, it protects the bank's collateral by ensuring that um, no liens are placed on the subject property associated with um, non-payment of property taxes. Um, and uh, additionally, it's important to know that 
property taxes often fluctuate from year to year. And as a result, the bank does an escrow analysis annually, and then the payments will be adjusted according to the changes in property taxes due or homeowners insurance premium due annually. Um, if the bank ends up over collecting an amount that exceeds $50 in that escrow portion, um, they're required by law to refund that amount to the borrower. Thank you so much. Lorna, when should I start looking for my homeowner's insurance? Um, well, I when I'm working with clients in a pre-approval status, um, I actually advise them to start calling either the agent insurance or sometimes they can check with the seller if they know the seller already um, to check with the insurance company that already carries coverage. But it's good to know ahead of time what your what an estimated annual premium might be because when we're going through a home uh, pre-approval, we're guessing at those numbers as part of the housing costs that we're qualifying you for. So the more accurate we can try to be with those numbers, the more accurate we can be with a loan number as well. So I advise usually ahead of time, definitely once you make an application, your lender is going to ask you to get a quote or get a couple of quotes so that we can have that in file and include those estimated quotes in our disclosures that we send out. But you'll definitely need to have a policy um, arranged and your application done with the agent prior to closing so that we can contact them and get what's called a binder. So it's that's basically what they do is they bind insurance on your property until your actual closing date. And then it goes into effect once the closing has happened. Wonderful. Becky, so I received my loan estimate and it has owners and lenders title insurance. And I know you've talked about homeowners insurance and mortgage insurance. What is the difference with the title insurance? Sure, Heather. So owner's title insurance is going to protect you as the owner if any title issues should arise after the purchase of the property. So there could be a tax lien or a mechanics lien that might pop up um, from prior to the purchase date, or there could be um, an unknown co-owner or an heir to the property that is trying to claim rights to the property. Title insurance is going to protect you from those issues. Um, lender's title insurance is going to cover those same types of title issues that might pop up but only the lender. So um, lenders title insurance is required because the lender always wants to protect their interest in that property. Owner's title insurance is actually optional, but it is um, suggested um, that you do purchase that. I once had a title agent tell me that it's, it's one of those things that's rarely needed, but when it is needed, if you didn't purchase it, you'll probably be sorry you didn't. Um, and if you did, you'll be very glad you did. Wonderful. And Brenda, when will I find out what my final cost to purchase the home will be? Uh, uh, so with the final closing disclosure? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm assuming that's where we're going here. Um, so three days prior to closing, um, we are required to uh, provide a closing disclosure to the um, borrower. And this document contains all of the final details associated with the loan request, including terms, projected payment, fees, costs, and finally, um, the cash to close amount, the amount that you would have to come to closing with. Um, it, it also provides a comparison between what was estimated and what the actual costs were so that you can see where you started and, and where you ended up. Um, the, the final cash to close amount is something that you will manage either via cashier's check or perhaps a, a wire to the um, closing attorney's account so that they can manage those disbursements at closing. Wonderful. And Lorna, so my closing day is coming up. What can I expect and how to buy prepare? 
Great. Um, well, if it's if it's coming up, you're gonna your broker, your real estate agent is gonna be asking you if you'd like to do a walkthrough of the property, probably the day before or the day of. Uh, many times it's the day of. So, and then you just go straight to closing, and everything's all great. You'll have received your closing disclosure that has the final amount due. And um, you can't write a personal check for that. So generally you will have made arrangements either to wire the funds from your bank account to the closing agent's account or bring a cashier's check to closing. The settlement agent or the closing agent and the, the title attorney takes all of the money in and then they disperse all of the money out from there. Um, if there are two of you buying the house and there's two of you on a mortgage or sometimes there's even four, generally most all of the parties need to be present, at least the, uh, the mortgage borrowers need to be present at closing with identification because the attorney is responsible for making sure that um, the right people are signing the right documents. Sometimes the seller is there, sometimes it's not, sometimes the agent is there, sometimes not. Uh, generally as a lender, I like to be at closings, but not all lenders do. So you can expect that it's at least going to be you, the home buyer, and the closing agent at closing with your ID and your funds. Um, sometimes there's there's some really nice conversation that goes on about memories in the home that the seller might have. Um, but generally at the end of the signing, you'll sign your loan documents and then you'll sign the transfer documents, which actually is going to tell all of the agencies that the property ownership is transferring from the seller to the to the buyer and um, that seller or the agent, the real estate agent may let you know who serviced the furnace in the past. There might be contractor contact information or, um, or just a reminder to transfer the utilities <laughs> into your name. All of those little final tidbits come together on closing day. And then once it's all over, you're a homeowner. Wonderful. And you want to make sure that once you get in, move into your home, that you get to you know your home, uh, know where your shutoff valves are, um, save for maintenance, prepare to maintain your home, um, and post those important phone numbers, change your locks, um, all those kind of basic things. Um, are there any questions in our chat box at this time? I'm not seeing any. Is there any other things our panelists would like to add? Heather, can I add something in regards to the title, sir? Of course you can. So um, prior to closing, prior to closing, the lender will have the title attorney perform a title search. And what that title search is doing is it's going back and looking at public records over the past 40 years. And it's verifying who the legal owner of the property is and if they indeed have a right to sell that property. It's also looking if there, at, if there are any liens or judgments against the property so that if there are, those can be taken care of prior to closing and don't leave the buyer of the property stuck with those to deal with after closing. Um, for example, I've had a couple instances where a title search was performed and there were mortgages um, listed against the property that the current owner was not even aware of. They were, had thought that they had been discharged by a previous mortgage company and they had not. But luckily we were able to clear those prior to closing so that when the uh, buyer purchased the property and we closed that they had a clear and a clear and marketable title to the property. So they were starting off clean with just the mortgage that they were getting as a lien on the property. So um, that is a very important piece and, and very helpful to the, to the buyer as they go through this process. Thank you so much for adding that, David. Well, that's all of our questions. I don't know if the panelists have any other questions to ask. We want to thank uh, First National Bank for partnering with Panquist to do our two Lunch and Learns. Uh, along with the last Homebuyer 101 Lunch and Learn, this will be posted to our Facebook page, as well as the Panquist.org website. 
Um, we encourage you to reach out to any one of these four lenders if you have any questions or to begin the process to purchase your next home or to get information to prepare you. Um, but this has been a lot of great information. Um, we're super excited to have brought this to the public and we want to thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Heather. Thank, thank you so Heather. Much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.